So we have Darwin having circled the world. He's gathered all of these, this information. He's made all of these observations. He's drawn a bunch of pictures. He found fossils. Do you guys know what fossils are, right? You've seen, you've, you've seen them. I'll show you a bunch of fossils. I love fossils. I have a bunch in my office. Um, because biologists, you can't help but it, love it. Oh, I found out something crazy. I was, I know, the sidebar, it really surprised me. I was, at, I was running a meeting for a bunch of scientists. And I was like, let's do like the icebreaker thing. And I said, what's your favorite dinosaur? Now, all of you have a favorite dinosaur, I assume, right? Yeah? Okay, who does not have a favorite dinosaur? Because you're weird. Okay, cool. You all got, you all got, Angel, what's your favorite dinosaur? Uh, See, right off the bat. Boom. Sasha, you got one? T-Rex. T-Rex eats stuff. Maria? None? You're just like the people in this meeting. I was shocked that these, sci these biologists didn't have a favorite dinosaur. I was like, I like the ankylosaur because it hits things in the knee. Um, there's so many reasons, so many things to love. They didn't. Anyways, Darwin collected all of these fossils. Um, and he noticed that some of them distinctly resembled organisms living in South America. So some of them were similar. He saw um, changes over time. He saw some weird things over time. One thing he saw was there was an earthquake that occurred. And during that earthquake, the land literally shifted up, I think it was by two meters. Two meters, about six feet. So earthquake happened and the earth moved. Surprise, right, earthquake. Um, the earth shifted and stayed that way. So he started thinking, after these rocks have been thrust up, what if that's happened many, many times over thousands of years? As these rocks shift upwards, you get mountains building. So he started thinking about that and looked at these, uh, these mountaintops and he noticed on the mountaintops, yeah, there were ocean creatures high up in the Andes, some of the highest points in the uh, South America. Well, how did these ocean creatures get there? From that shifting, from these rocks moving. And the only way he could explain that was by the Earth being much, much older than it's been thought at this point in the Earth's history. So evidence did not support the traditional view that the Earth was only a few thousand years old. That's a big change to the world. Oh, fun story. Um, now, you, you won't care about it much, but I'm going to tell you the story because I care about it. This is a crinoid fossil. It looks almost like a... Um, uh, face hugger from alien um this is the way you always see them displayed in the museum and just recently it turns out that they're actually supposed to be flipped upside down it's like this flower thing hanging down and a big bulb filled with gases at the top and it was floating in the water so yeah like i said you don't care important to me so i thought i'd let you know the earth is older than people think what really got Darwin's mind going was when he went to the Galapagos Islands, which, by the way, here at Brightpoint, um, they just did a trip out to the Galapagos for um, environmental science students and biology students. So you just missed it. Um, but what he found there was uh, the Galapagos were a group of volcanic islands. They're about 900 kilometers west of South America. Uh, I love this because, seriously, if you've got a, if you've got a tortoise, you've got to ride the tortoise. Um, popular Victorian activity. Tortoises and lizards, iguanas, aquatic iguanas. <laughs> um, although the animals on the Galapagos resembled the animals living in South America, most of them were sort of unique. So you have them looking like these organisms close by, but there are changes. And that got Darwin thinking, maybe they came in and they started to um, adapt to these regions. So on the left side here, you can see the South American version of the iguana, the Galapagos version. They're similar. So Darwin hypothesized that the uh, Galapagos were colonized by a small group of organisms, and then uh, that had come, come from South America about five million years ago, and then they started to radiate out into all the islands. So you can see they first get to a small island, 
about 2.2 million years ago, about a million to 2.2 million years ago, then they move out some more islands. And then less than a million years ago, they colonized the large island. That gave rise to new variations throughout these islands. And they were all isolated from each other for the most part. There wasn't a free flow of populations. And we'll get to why that's important in the next uh, set of lectures. So he began to narrow his focus on studying the adaptations of certain organisms. And you're going to hear about these guys a lot. These are Darwin's finches. Yeah, right? This is the big thing about birds. They are all started from the same basal species, finch. But based on the resources available on the islands, you got different sized beaks. Some beaks, like um, this large one at the top, were adapted to breaking nuts. It takes a big beak to break a nut. Basically, there's a leverage thing going on there. You guys ever crack nuts? Yeah, it's kind of hard to do. Um, oh, think about it this way. Uh, have you ever had a jawbreaker? When you're biting into a jawbreaker, where do you bite it? Do you bite it at the front of your teeth or the back? Always at the back, because that's where you're going to have the greatest amount of uh, pressure, but for bite force. The larger beak ended up giving them a lot of bite force at the back so they could crack the nut. <clears throat> Some of them have very thin beaks for getting into logs to grab insects. Some of them have sharp, thin beaks for breaking, um, for literally slicing uh, leaves. Wherever they were, they, uh, Darwin found that they were adapted to the food on that island. So he thought adaptation and the origin of the new species had to be very closely related. I, I really like this picture. There's a bunch of different bird beaks. Um, if you've ever seen bird, be you've seen bird beaks, obviously, because you've, you're alive. Um, like, think of a, a flamingo that filters. Its beak is specially adapted to it, and it's almost like it was perfectly designed for it. But all of these guys had similar common ancestry. What forced them into this uh, current shape was that that small differences built up over time, and it gave them an adaptive advantage. New species arise very slowly from accumulation of differences um, and ad adaptations to different environments. And Darwin's finches were basically the poster child for this, and they're still the poster child for it. This led to the idea of natural selection. Certain individuals have inherited traits that allow them to survive and reproduce at higher rates. So take a look at these guys. These are moths. Another textbook example. It's called Industrial Melanism. Um, a long, long time ago, before coal became a big thing. I know, it's a really long time ago. The trees in England uh, were basically white with small black dots on them. Uh, shoot. Have you guys ever played Minecraft? Okay. Which trees are white with small dots? Birch, thanks. That's the best way of learning biology is Minecraft. Uh, the birch trees. So these moths would land on birch trees and they would be hidden. The black moths weren't around as much because they stood out on white birch. Over time, though, as industrialism picked up and there was a lot of coal soot in the air, those white birch trees became dark. And the white moths ended up have it being at a reproductive disadvantage because they were easily spotted and able to be eaten. So they, uh, this is natural selection at work. One type of organism, one type of phenotype, the way it looks, is selected for at the expense of another. Darwin didn't want to publish his findings. He found this out and he's like, oh, I can't say anything about it. Um, he didn't want to publish his findings because he was scared of being attacked. So he held off a long time until the 1850s. At that point, another guy, Alfred Wallace, about the same age, another scientist said, I've got an idea. And he came up with almost the exact same idea as Darwin. Two scientists independently came up with the same idea. Have you guys heard of Alfred Wallace before this? Not many people. And the reason not many people have heard of it it's like a super nice thing he did. Wallace was getting ready to publish. And a friend of Wallace's and a mutual friend of Wallace and Darwin said, you know, Chuck Darwin also has an idea very similar to this.
let's talk to him first. So before Wallace published, he talked to Darwin and allowed Darwin to publish his idea first because he came up with it first. That's why we all know Charles Darwin and nobody knows Alfred Wallace. Wallace came up with it too, independently, but he allowed Darwin to publish his work before he published his. And that's where we get this, The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection. This book is um, sort of laid the groundwork for most of our current evolutionary thought. Uh, never in this book, though, is the word evolution ever mentioned. Like, that's more of a new term. All Darwin was trying to do was explain how we got new species through natural selection. Um, so he summarized his the seventh modification idea. And actually what he ended up using was things that people already knew happened. Chickens, for instance. They knew how livestock were able to, you know, you were able to choose better and better livestock, how horses were bred. These ideas led into Darwin's work and made it really easy for people to start accepting. So the idea that species change over time started to become more widely accepted. So there we go, Charles Darwin. He found evidence that life was um, changing and that the geologic world was changing, that we don't have a young earth. Um, he found fossilized organisms up in the mountains that were from the ocean. And the only way that could have happened is if the earth is way older than people thought it was. He ended up finding that organisms on the east coast of Africa I'm sorry, west coast of Africa and east coast of South America look similar to each other, as if the two continents had split apart. Um, he found that organisms on the Galapagos look similar to the ones that were on the uh, mainland, with slight differences. They were adapted to their environments. Those adaptations allowed them reproduce, to reproduce more. They had an adaptive advantage. They could reproduce faster or better. Um, and that, in the end, led to the spread of those species. So that's where we're getting the descent, uh, the origin of the species through natural selection. So this says, describe the observations that Charles Darwin made. The big observations that Charles Darwin made were the, the organisms were, and we're going to get into this in a lot more detail in the lab as well as in the next, um, the next slide, the next lecture. But um, basically. He collected all of that data on fossils. He found that there were um, ocean fossils up in the mountains. He found that organisms look similar on the east coast of South America and the west coast of um, Africa. He found that organisms are uniquely suited to their environments and they resemble organisms that are on the mainland. What did he hypothesize about the Galapagos island species? He hypothesized that over time, those species moved from island to island. And as they moved from one island to another island, they had to adapt to um, whatever food source was on that new island. And by Darwin's descent with modification, he was talking about over time, small changes in, um, in an offspring will lead to big changes in the population. So it's not going to be caused by you, the parent, grew your neck longer, and thus your child has a longer neck. But there's something in there that gets passed to the offspring that the children are different. And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture.